it is interesting, isn't it? To to because we don't know what consciousness is, right? Right. So it's, a, it's often called a hard problem in science. We don't know. So it's a good question whether you can build. Let's say you want to build a self-replicating machine, which is what you're talking about, and something that can go and maybe go to the moon or Mars and replicate itself and then carry on, which is a living thing, I suppose. Yes. Does it have to have a sufficient level of intelligence that it actually is conscious? And all these things that we talked about, this this word meaning that we used earlier, that we all understand yeah. but can't define, is that a emergent property that, that has to emerge if you've got something that's intelligent enough to replicate itself and live and, right. as you said, be the... I, I don't know the answer, but it's worth considering that this thing this what we emotion meaning love and fear and all those things are just the things that happen when you are intelligent right i, I don't know the answer to that the caveat is always that we don't know about we don't this know. yeah it's, it's it's just not understood well i um, i think there's something weird happening. it's physical though i'm damn yes. sure it's physical i'm damn sure that there's nothing going on in my head other than what is allowed by the laws of nature as we understand them so, so eliminating sure. woo, you mean the yeah. idea of uh, a soul being some sort of a divine thing that's inside the housing of the body? Yeah, I mean, I I, yeah. I would say we can rule that out. Actually, I've argued in the past. How do you rule it out? I've argued we can rule that out in the following manner. <laughs> so, okay. so, so here's my arm, right? So it's made of electrons and protons and neutrons. And uh, if I if I have a soul in there, something that we don't understand, but it's a different kind of energy or whatever it is that we don't have in physics at the moment it, it interacts with matter because i'm moving my hand around so whatever it is it's something that interacts very strongly with matter but if you look at the history of particle physics in particular which is the study of matter we spend we spent decades making high precision measurements of how matter behaves and interacts and we look for for example for a fifth force of nature so we know four forces the gravity the two nuclear forces, called the weak and strong nuclear forces, and electromagnetism. And that's what we know exists. And we look for another one with ultra high precision, and we don't see any evidence of it. So I would claim that we know how matter interacts at these energies, so room temperature now, these energies, we know how matter interacts very precisely. And so if you want to suggest there's something else that interacts with matter strongly, then I would say that it's ruled out. I would go as far as to say it is ruled out by experiment, or at least it is extremely subtle, and you would have to jump through a lot of hoops to come up with a theory of some stuff that we wouldn't have seen when we've observed how matter interacts that is present in our bodies. And presumably, if you believe in the soul, you want it to exist outside. When you die, you still want the thing to be there, and you might believe in ghosts and things like that. Mm. I mean, look at a ghost. I mean, it's a... It is something that carries the imprint of you, presumably. It looks like you, right? So that means that it interacts strongly with the matter that is you, because mm. it carries a pattern. If it carries a pattern, it carries information. Well, now we are going to discuss what happens when asteroids hit. And, and Rusty, you mentioned earlier, actually, that your colleagues on Apollo had had a very good view of what happens when asteroids hit because we can see the surface of the moon. So can you contrast the two, the Earth and the moon? Yeah, you fly around the moon and you know you see millions of asteroid uh, craters uh, and that's really in some sense a better indicator than looking at the Earth in terms of understanding the shooting gallery you know that we're part of uh, as we go around the sun. Uh, People don't see that, uh, of course, uh, here on the Earth. And the reason, partly, is because Mother Earth protects us. You know, it's, it, it, Gaia or Mother Earth really uh, takes care of us, both in the form of an atmosphere, which really protects us from the smaller asteroids as they come in. Unless something is about the size of a three-bedroom house, it's not going to make it to the ground. It'll burn up in the atmosphere if it's fairly big, like, uh, you know, four years ago at Chelyabinsk, that was about a 20 meter diameter object. And that one came in, didn't quite hurt anybody, didn't kill anybody. Uh, it blew up in the atmosphere and created a shock wave. 
But if it gets bigger than about a three bedroom house or so, then you're gonna find uh, serious damage on the ground. Uh, if it hits over water, it would have to be a good bit bigger to cause a tsunami. But the tsunamis are actually quite dangerous and a large asteroid hitting in the ocean would create uh, a lot of havoc around the borders of that water body. Um, water is very efficient at transmitting the energy of the impact long distances, uh, even more than if it's uh, an explosion in air. Uh, but there are, the, the millions of craters that we see on the moon is the best indication to people that, you know, we're talking about a reality here. Yeah. And, and actually, most of those craters, Patrick, were created, or a lot of them, during the late heavy bombardment. So, so in terms of the history, because if you look at the moon, you think it's remarkable that we've survived this long, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But uh, we have a very short period uh, compared to the age of the Earth. So we, we need to remember. In fact, it's thanks to the uh, uh, crater on the moon that we could uh, estimate that the current impact flux in the inner solar system is on average constant. Uh, uh, now we have the big basins and thanks to the Apollo mission which could date this basin and there seems to have been a, 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 an intensity in the impact flux about 3.9 billion years ago. We call that the late heavy bombardment because it didn't start at the origin of the solar system, I mean, or just when the Earth was formed, but it took a little time, about 700 million years, before suddenly there was a spike in the impact flux, which made these lunar basins. And therefore, it was uh, difficult to understand how this could happen. It turns out that these are people in my team in Nice who generated the model, which is now the mostly recognized, which explained the LHB. It's called the Nice model, which if you read in English could be the nice model. So necessarily it's, it's correct. <laughs> and uh, basically, it, uh, it explains the uh, architecture, the current architecture of the solar system. So we reproduce, it explains why we have these uh, asteroids uh, uh, sharing the same orbit of Jupiter. It explains also the, the small elongation of the orbit of Jupiter and Saturn. And it explains the late heavy movement. And the reason is that when the solar system formed and the, pla the giant planets were formed, they were surrounded by a disk of planets behind, which are... It's, but for, for whatever reason, for people, there is some incredible motivation to find uh, a divine something or another that's there's something greater than this physical being that there's something what do you think that is like what is that compulsion it, we we've already sort of talked a bit about it. it i think it goes to the the heart of this question of what it means to be human mm. so i would say that being human the answer <laughs> right to the it's not I, I don't have the answer to the meaning of it all but the, an answer would be uh, we are small, finite beings, right, which are just clusters of atoms. As we said before, they're very rare, but we understand roughly how they, how they came to be. And we have a, a limited amount of time, not actually unfortunately, but because of the laws of nature. Now, the laws of nature forbid us to be immortal. They, 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 immortality is ruled out by the laws of physics. But also, actually, what, what's interesting about if you look at the basic physics of the universe, going from the Big Bang to where we are today, then the physics is driven by the fact that the universe began in an extremely ordered state. So it was a very highly ordered system. And it is tending towards a more disordered system at the moment. And that's called the second law of thermodynamics. And it's that basic common sense thing that things go to shit <laughs> right? that's a, yeah. basically it's a second law of thermodynamics what we strongly suspect and, and I would say no uh, is that in that process of going from order to disorder complexity emerges naturally for a brief period of time so it's a natural part of the evolution of the universe that you get a period in time when there's complexity in the universe so stars and planets and galaxies and life and civilizations but they are they exist because the universe is decaying not in spite of the fact the universe is decaying so our existence in that sort of picture is necessarily finite and necessarily time limited and it is a remarkable thing that that complexity has got so far that there are things in the universe that can think and feel and explore it 
And I think that is the answer. If you want an answer to the meaning of it all, it's that. That you are part of the universe because of the way the laws of nature work. You are allowed to exist, but you're allowed to exist for a temporary or for a small amount of time in a possibly infinite universe.